Uh, one of the troubles with being a man who spends most of his life writing books is that I don't have many adventures. Other people go off into their workplace and they come back and have stories to tell about the people they've seen and the things they've done. But the adventures I have are mainly the ones that I have inside my head, except every once in a while. And uh, I was going to tell you about one small adventure I had last summer that was, meant a lot to me and has left its mark. My wife and I went to Texas for the first time, and I spoke in a number of different places, one of which was a marvelous retreat center called Laity Lodge in Kerrville, Texas. If you've never been there, give it a try. It's a magic place, both as a place, located in the uh, river valley, the Frio River, and to get to it, you have to drive in the river for about a mile and a half, actually in the water, with the water sloshing around your hubcaps. Uh, but magic also, in terms of somehow the, the, the magic that's generated by the people there, a lot of whom have been coming back for a long time. And I found that within a very short time of our arrival, we were there for about a week, I felt extraordinarily safe in, in the way that you normally would think of feeling safe only in the bosom of your own family, safe to be whoever I was, to say whatever came into my mind, not worried about making a good show of it or anything like that. So when at one point they said, uh, I was sort of wondering what I was, would talk about to them. They said, they said, wing it. And I thought, well, I don't mind doing that because I feel so comfortable here. And I said, well, what sort of, how would you like me to wing it? Wing it about what? And they said, how about telling your own story? So I volunteered to do that and did. And um, in place of telling them about my childhood, I read them a small section from a recent book of mine, actually written for children, though published, as it turned out, just as a regular adult book, called The Wizard's Tide, in which I described an episode of my childhood which I said could sort of stand for the, the shadow side of it, what made it tough. And I'll just quickly tell you what that episode consisted of. It was, this takes place in the 1930s during the Depression, uh, when there wasn't much money, awful lot of drinking going on in the world and in my family. And, um, an unsettled and unsettling time, even for a child of 10, which I was. And the episode I described was once when uh, my father had come back from somewhere and he'd obviously had too much to drink and my mother didn't want him to take the car. So she got the keys from him somehow and uh, gave them to me and said, don't let your father have these. I'd already gone to bed. So I took the car keys and I was in bed and I had them in my fist under the pillow and my father came and somehow knew I had the keys and said, uh, give them to me, I've got to have them, I've got to go someplace. And I just didn't know what to say or what to be or how to react. I was frightened and sad and all the rest of it. So I lay there and listened to him pleading, really, give me the keys. And uh, I pulled the covers over my head to escape the situation and then finally went to sleep with his voice, I suppose, in my ears. A sad story, which stood for a lot of other sadness of those early years. When it was over, when I finished reading it, a man named Howard Butt, who is uh, the head of the Butt Foundation, which finances Laity Lodge, came up to me and said something I was utterly unprepared for, uh, which is really my starting place. He said, uh, you've had a fair amount of pain in your life, like everybody else. And he said, you've been a good steward of it. And that caught me absolutely off guard that phrase, to be a steward of your pain. I didn't hear it as a compliment, particularly, because it's not as if I'd set out to be a steward of my pain and did it and that was a good work, but rather something that had happened. And I thought a lot about what that means, the stewardship of pain, uh, and the ways in which we deal with pain. This side of being a steward of it, there are alternatives Lord knows, the most tempting of which I think is to forget it, to hide it, to cover it over, to pretend it never happened because it's too hard to deal with, it's too unsettling to remember. And in a way I think the world is always asking us to do it that way. Our families are always, in a way, part of the, of the uh, family system is so apt to be. Don't talk about things that cause pain. You can't trust the world with those secrets. Those are family secrets. Keep them hidden. 
keep them hidden from each other, even keep them hidden from yourself. Don't allow yourself to feel them. My mother, uh, who lived to be a, almost 92, survived very well in this world by, in a way, burying her bad times. And she remained almost up to the end a very valuable, interesting person. But she s paid a price for that because a certain part of her stopped growing in the direction of compassion and wisdom and so on. Another thing you can do with your pain, of course, is to use it to win sympathy. I guess a sob story is a story you tell hoping that people will sob with you, sort of an end in itself, a way almost of giving yourself a kind of stature in the eyes of the world as a suffering one. Another way, I suppose, of dealing with your pain is to use it as an excuse for the failure of your life, if you think of yourself as failure. If only I'd gotten the breaks, uh, if only those bad things hadn't happened, who knows where I might have been today. And then, of course, another great temptation about pain, I think, is to allow yourself to be embittered by it, to be trapped by it. And the classic example of that is uh, that tragic character of Miss Havisham in Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, that wonderful novel. This woman who was deserted by her bridegroom on her wedding day, he never showed up, and she spends the rest of her day sitting in the room where the great reception was to have been with a wedding cake moldering and her dress long since turned to rags, imprisoned in a sadness that she simply never could escape. All of these are, I think, ways, options of dealing with pain. But what uh, Howard Butt said was this notion of being a steward of it, stewardship of pain. What does that mean? I've thought a lot about it. I think it means before anything else, to keep in touch with it. To keep in touch with your pain, keep in touch with the sad times, with the hard times of your past. For many reasons. One, because I think often it's those times when we were most alive, when we were somehow closest to being most vitally human beings. Keep in touch with it because it's at those moments of pain where you are most open to the pain of other people, most open to your own deep places. Keep in touch with those sad times because those painful times, because it's then that you are most aware of two things, your own powerlessness, crushed in a way by what's happening to you, but also most aware of God's power to somehow pull you through it, to be with you in it. Keeping in touch with your pain, I think, means also to be true to who in your depths you have it in you to be. Depths of pain also, in a way, depths of joy, because they both come from the same place. I think also, when I think of stewardship of pain, of that strange, dark, harsh, parable Jesus tells, which doesn't turn out at all the way you'd expect a story like that, to tell of the talents. You remember the master who gives the three servants come and he gives one five talents, one two, and another one one talent, and off they go. And he comes back on the day of reckoning and asks the five talent man what he's done with his money. And he said, I've traded with it. I've got five more. And he, uh, the master says, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. The two talent man has made another two. And then the one talent man, you remember, said, well, I was afraid and I hid my talent in the ground, but I still have it. Here is my one talent. And the master says, you wicked and slothful servant, uh, cast him into outer darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. Take from him what he has and give it to the others, for from whom who hath not it will be taken and given to those who have. This strange and frightening story. To begin with the negative part of it first, it seems to me that the one talent man represents what I said before, somebody who buried the richest treasure he had in a way, not just pain, but the most alive part of himself, buried it in the ground, never, become, never was able to become who he might have been. And I think the outer darkness that the master casts him out into is not to be thought of so much as punishment as it is to be thought of as the inevitable consequence of what it means to bury your life. If you bury your life, you don't lead your life. You don't meet other people who are alive. You are alone. You're in the dark. 
and from him who hath not it will be taken, those hard words, that if the life is buried, if the pain is somehow covered over and forgotten, instead of growing, you shrink, become less, you become diminished. The positive side of it, of course, is the other ones, the ones who uh, came back with more than they started out with, as the parable says, they traded with their talents. They traded with their lives. Wonderful phrase that we were made to be life traders because I have what you need, which is me, and you have what you need, which is you. And that is the joy into which the master invites his servants. So that pain can become a treasure if we treasure it, if we treasure it to the point where it can become compassion and healing, not just for ourselves, but also for other people. And if you want to see that sort of thing in operation, the treasuring of pain, the using of pain to the healing of yourself and others, someday attend an open meeting of AA or any of the related groups where that's exactly what those people are doing, sharing their hurts, their experiences, and their joys. And remember the cross, because it seems to me that the cross of Christ, in a way, speaks somewhat like this same word, saying that out of that greatest pain, endured in love and faithfulness, comes the greatest beauty and our greatest hope. 